the thing is, the reality is that we need to create IPs. You need people to actually be interested in it too. And that was the failures again from the past. We're like, oh, we created these things, but we're like, we don't have the audience. Nobody knows that we're making these things. And so it's like, if you're creating something, you're putting it out there and it kind of like, pfft, it's like it goes into the air and you're like, oh, all right. Uh, nobody saw it, I guess. So this was like, okay, let's get more calculated about it. And we're like, let's just, you know, what do other people do? It's like YouTubers, they create an audience and then they, they bring out something else, they bring something like a product out. And so we're like, okay, let's just take that route. And yeah. so we ended up, yeah, doing the TikTok part. And, you know, it's like, it's been really interesting because we actually take we have contests that we run on TikTok too, to be in the comic, which is really fun because people are throwing lore back at us now. So they're like came, coming up with characters from the world and like yeah. with factions. And this is like the dream. So I was like, oh man, this is crazy. <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 43 of the Art Department Podcast. It's Emmanuel Shu in San Francisco, myself, Jan Urschel in Singapore. And out of, actually I didn't, never ask, I think out of LA, we have yes. Robert Simmons and uh, Peggy Chong, the owners and co-founders of GadgetBot. Um, and today they're going to share a little bit with us about how they... Uh, founded the studio, how it's like running the studio. They're a husband and wife team um, and also have two dogs. And I'm sure they're um, very important in terms of running the studio. So they'll yes. share with us um, a lot of stories, a lot of struggles. Um, they also have recently released their first uh, IP um, and we'll definitely talk about that. But before we get into that, um, maybe I'll give them a chance to introduce themselves and give us a little bit of, little bit of background um, where they came from. And yeah, please go ahead, Robert, Peggy. Welcome to the show. Oh, oh yeah. Well, awesome. before that happens, it's Robert Simons. Did I, <laughs> did I say it wrong? Oh, my <laughs> God. My God. Actually, before that, we tried to get it right and I got it right and now I got it wrong. Okay. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> Um, but Peggy, do you want to go first or how do you feel? Yeah. I mean, so with us, you know, me and Robert, we met during art center. So at the time it was, uh, 2008. Yeah. Um, and wow. you know, yeah. for us, we met there and at the time that was part of the program that Scott Robertson had created entertainment design. I believe, uh, Nisi guys had him on there on the podcast as well. He, we're the same kind of group of students that came through there. Um, uh, we can get into a little more detailed, but basically after mm -hmm. that we found it. Our, uh, gadget bot. So 2011 was that time that we opened up the company. Yeah, I think um, I, I think what's really important about uh, at least the history that we came from with Art Center is that um, both Peggy and I were part of a program of Art Center called Saturday High Program. Mm -hmm. And so what they do is they take in high school students uh, and they start teaching you some of the curriculums and things like that that you're going to go through, uh, depending what major you're interested in. So like we both separately, we yeah. weren't actually we didn't meet each other yet at that time, but separately around the same time, Peggy was taking uh, product and transportation design classes, and so was I. Um, you did it for about a year, I think, yeah. and then I did it for about three years. Yeah. So I had kind of like a pre-education to Art Center before I actually got into the school itself. Mm -hmm. um, they get you early. <laughs> yes, exactly. That, that uh, was high school, you said, right? That was yeah. high school. Oh, wow. Um, and so the the classes were were they're fairly cheap back then for like high school students to take. Yeah. I don't know what they are now currently. They were like like two or three hundred. Yeah, they so. were they were insanely cheap. But um, that yeah. that's a big part of Peggy and I's history and all this is that we uh, we didn't grow up with a lot of money, um, mm -hmm. either of us. And so a lot of this was like when we had to make that step to actually get into art school and move forward. It was a lot of kind of scraping things together and figuring out where we could get scholarships from and yeah. uh, different things like that in order to get our ways through. Yeah, because like even the Saturday High program, my sister paid for the first one, but she was like, yeah, you got to cover the rest. And I was like 15 by that point. I was like, okay, fine. So I found that there was a scholarship program. You just get scholarship, turn in your portfolio. If they approve, you get a free class. So I just kept doing that for years and years. Wow. And then wow. when it got to uh, Art Center itself, same thing. It was like financial aid and scholarship to, to really get through it because obviously it's it's not a cheap school. So. Yeah. And I don't know how much we all want to cover mm -hmm. within this little bit, but definitely like what inspired us to sort of move forward into the company we have today, or at least GadgetBot mm -hmm. itself, is when we were in art school or in Art Center, uh, and we actually made it to the college side of it. Um, yeah. It was being run like what, what Peggy was saying earlier, it was being run by Scott Robertson. And Peggy and I were fortunate enough that around probably 20, like 2010 mm -hmm. or something like that, we were yeah. able to go over to DSP or Scott's mm, right. uh, uh, studio at the time. And Neville Page was also there. And that just like 
that'll be a lot of this conversation today, but that blew Peggy and I away that uh, these uh, two artists that were huge um, yeah. uh, inspirations for us had this space together and were creating all these things within this studio space. Yeah, I think it's the uh, alternate working possibilities. You know, like we knew of like studios, you go in and work with like a game studio or an animation studio, but to see, to walk in and just see like artists just working, you know, and remotely at the time, right? It's not the same, like obviously now everybody does. But at that time, it was like, oh, oh, this is a possibility. This is really cool. So that was that was one of them. Yeah. The other one was, I, I don't know if you guys remember, but Kang Lee was making a game called Hawken oh, a yeah. couple of years mm -hmm. back yeah, yeah. with mm -hmm. Adhesive, right? So he created that studio with a couple of other people and our friend. Uh, Around the same time. This is like 2010, I think. Really, so. really close. It was time. before Hawken even ever came out. Yeah. And so uh, our friend uh, Miles, he was, uh, Miles Bradford, he yeah. was interning. or Actually, no, he was working for them. And so he invited us to come check it out. And so we saw that studio and we're like, oh, this is, this is really cool because it's like, you know, it's like an indie game company. It was a bunch of artists, a lot of like talented people together and just working together. And so that too was another one that was like, oh, alternate working possibilities. This is really, really interesting. Yeah. So I mean, obviously another artist too, IP development. That was really, really cool to see. Oh, wow. But for oh, you guys, there was never any question, even right out of like, uh, right in high school, that art is the thing for you, right? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's where we can start getting some meat of it there. Mm -hmm. um, for myself, uh, I'm extremely dyslexic. Uh, something I bring up all the time with the company because everybody has to deal with it, especially with COVID, mm -hmm. uh, with the Slack channels. It's like everybody has to deal with my writing. Um, but a lot of that played into what I wanted to do as I got older because um, I was kind of looking at the scope of the world and there's lots of things I wanted to do. Like I wanted to be an astronaut and all these different things as a kid, obviously. But uh, I, uh, I could always visualize everything very, uh, clearly, uh, even as a kid, obviously the, the, the drawings weren't that good, but you could see the 3d forms and shapes pretty well though. And the things I was creating. So I, I probably knew about the time I was 14 or 15, like this is what I wanted to do. I just didn't know where that was just yet because I was starting to focus in on transportation. I knew that mm -hmm. you could get a job doing art for vehicle design or product design yeah. didn't and this is going to sound really weird didn't understand that you could get a job in entertainment design even though at the same around the same time my brother was doing voice acting for a character in a show called invader zim oh uh, wow okay i remember and that. so i knew that was around but i didn't fully understand that i myself could get a job as an right, artist right, in that yeah, industry yeah. and so that that took a little bit to play out like i had to follow this path of wanting to be a transportation designer and then i met scott robertson and then i learned that there was entertainment design and you could do stuff for like star wars and all these different properties and it blew my mind uh at like 14 15. yeah um yeah it was yeah i mean that's very uh you know i get for me it was uh i remember watching like it was a couple of things star wars right you see it and you're like that to me was that world building side it was like wait hold on you just come up with the world and make up stories and you do the art like that seems really cool and um, it was like from there, I was playing a lot of games, you know, there's like a lot of Blizzard games, like Diablo, Warcraft, all that stuff. And seeing the books, seeing the art, I was like, okay. But for some reason, I don't know, sometimes you don't connect the two things. And it was only uh, when I had to do like a tour of Art Center just to like quickly take a look because I was like, oh, do I want to go here for a class? Because, you know, it was a friend that was like, hey, you should check out this high school program. Um, when I got there, I was walking around. I was like, oh, my God, it was like Hogwarts, you know, like it's like <laughs> Hogwarts for artists. You're like, this is crazy. Everybody has a sketchbook. Everybody, everything is revolved around art. And it was like I just went home that day and I was just like searching the Internet. And I came across conceptart.org. I think a lot of people had seen that back in the day. And I was like, oh, right. These people work on games and films and they get paid to draw. And I was like, wait, OK, all right, this is what I need to do. And so it's kind of from there. It was like figure drawing, transportation design, just like product design and just trying to figure out how to get there. And it was still like, at the time, they didn't have a program for it. It was just kind of like you kind of take pieces of the programs, different programs and put them together. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I think to kind of go off what Peggy was talking about too in, in, in the, the conversation still, um, I, I always wanted to do art, but I didn't necessarily, I, I actually wanted to create my own worlds. That was my biggest focus uh, as probably a kid and a teenager that, I didn't necessarily like drawing all the things that people like. I didn't do mm -hmm. fan art or any of that stuff as a kid. Like everything I did was just drawing like things that I had ideas for and stuff like that. And yeah. for me, 
instead of being able to write like everybody else could, especially as being super dyslexic, I was just drawing everything from all the worlds I was having ideas for. And I would jot down some notes that I could like read somewhat clearly, but most of it was just jotting down character designs and vehicle designs and world environments and stuff like that in order to actually flush out these worlds, yeah. um, which will lead more to like where we are as a company now uh, in the future. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm, you know, I'm just curious. Uh, so, so you came out of our center, you know, you, you went to DSP and, you know, like I, I know you had always had a seed planted that, you know, you want to have your own place. Mm-hmm. So did, did you just, I mean, because that takes a, you know, I mean, I remember when, you know, when I came out of school, I mean, I, I never thought I could do that. Like, you know, at any point, uh, much yeah. less right at the beginning, I mean, so was it like, did you just transition straight to that? Naive, (laughs) uh, maybe ego driven that we could do it when we couldn't. Um, (laughs) So yeah, like. um, I think we knew it would take time though. It wasn't like we opened the the studio and we were like, hey, we do this. But it was like one of those things like you're not getting feedback, right? Because we're so new, you know, there's obviously a lot of studios that do it. Yeah. So it was like one of those things where like, well, you know, we still need to find jobs and do things. And it's like in time, we just keep pushing for it. Yeah. Yeah. Like when we were in school, we saw all these things that Scott and Neville mm-hmm. and all of them were doing. And it it, it drove this fire in us because uh, to, to add to this conversation, um, when we were in Scott's studio and we saw all these different things, he also offered to Peggy and I to go pitching. So mm-hmm. what we did is we were developing stories with him at some point. We were taking those stories to go pitch. Nothing ever went through at the end of the day, but it just kind of taught us like how his system worked and, and what they were doing and, and <clears throat> what they were trying to create to actually pitch. Yeah. When we kind of got towards the end of schooling, this was probably like around 2011, that was when Peggy and I had decided to make a yeah. gadget bot. But mm-hmm. There's a lot more that went into it rather than us just saying like, hey, we want to make a studio. There's yeah. a lot of life events that happened. And mm-hmm. um, at, at, at the end of 2010, beginning of 2011, my father was starting to get really sick. Uh, and I was going through school still at that time. I think we were like fifth term to sixth term yeah. or something like that. Or yeah, yeah. And uh, I was starting to build some relationships and things like that through internships and stuff that Peggy and I were doing. Mm-hmm. I had met back in 2009, uh, this artist named Ben Proctor, mm-hmm. uh, who is now the production designer of Avatar, or at least one of them outside of Dylan Cole. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, he, he had been looking at my work for a few years. And so when 2011 had come around, I was still in contact with Ben and, uh, he was just basically like offering uh, suggestions to my work, things that I could do to help improve like environment designs, things like that, that I was doing. Um, and so I was pushing everything I could to, to just try to like create movie looking level assets uh, to see what he thought of those. But at this same time that I was like building this portfolio and creating this thing and talking to him, Peggy and I were playing with this idea like, oh, it'd be so cool if we were to create a studio one day so we could go and create our own projects. It'd be so mm-hmm. easy. Yeah. Um, my dad actually passed away, uh, at the beginning of 2011 and he was my everything. Uh, it, he, because of my dyslexia, I was really close to my dad. And, and, and the reason why is like, I did homeschooling with him from, uh, middle school all the way till the end of high school. And so I would develop stories with him. I'd create all these different drawings and things like that. And my dad would also like write down ideas and things. Um, it was just a relationship that me and him shared. And so when he passed away at the end of 2011, I kind of lost sight of everything. <clears throat> I wasn't interested in art anymore. I just, I kind of lost uh, my drive or my passion at that time. And so it was sort of a lot of refinding myself because suddenly all the opportunities came to mm-hmm. at that same exact time. And that's a, it was a, a, a very hard time, Peggy knows obviously, cause you were yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was trying to figure out how to take all these opportunities that were coming in that my father had sort of helped me build for myself over the last, like, you know, five years or so of going to Art Center, but also dealing with the emotional impact of losing him um, and trying to move forward in that way. And the reason why I had to bring all these things up and it's very jumbled and confusing is because they all kind of made what Peggy and I have now within that year, within 2011. Mm -hmm. Um, And so... 
at the end of Art Center, for me at least, this was the sixth term, I just decided to leave. Um, my dad had passed away towards the end of that term. I wasn't able to complete my classes. Um, uh, at the time, it was Tim Flattery who was running the department over at Entertainment Design for Art Center. And him uh, and Thomas Bertley were extremely, um, they were there for me the entire time. Uh, and they were helping me through that situation, like trying to figure out what to do with my dad. But Ben Proctor also came around and offered me an opportunity to work on the movie The Thing. Oh, yeah. um, and so yeah. Tim was sort of helping coach me through what the film industry is like, um, but also to to kind of help not heal because you can't heal that part of your heart. Like once something breaks that hard, it, it's more just what to think about and what to go through in that moment. Um, and so I, I took the opportunity and it was it was just extremely strange because it's like, you know, you should be extremely happy to have this opportunity, but it's just, your emotions are up and down. Obviously you're not right mind. Yeah. Was it within three months? Was uh, it, it was within, really? it was within two months of really close. everything that had happened. Yeah. Um, so, so just, just a little timeline here. So, so yeah. this is, bef this is you taking it as Robert and not gadget bot, right? I'm taking or it is as it Robert? This was not okay, gadget. Okay. Okay. This, okay. this is everything that was being developed for this, for the thing product. Um, oh, you guys still there? Okay, almost lost you for a second. Um, and so uh, uh, I, I took that project, was able to develop a bunch of stuff. And the reason why that project is important to bring up is I was able to prove myself to Ben at that time that I was ready to work on these projects. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He himself couldn't work on it, and I was he offered my name in order to bring me on to mm -hmm. it. Um, and then uh, I, I think I was only on that project for me about four or five weeks. It was pretty short. So yeah. it was like a VFX stint. I then came out of that. Everything went great on the project, but I just crashed uh, emotionally after mm -hmm. that because it was just, I, I got through that stint of doing that thing, but mentally my mind was all over the place still. I still wasn't in a good place after my dad had passed away. Um, and so I took sort of my own sabbatical. Like I was, mm -hmm. I was doing whatever little work I could do because our entire financial my entire financial uh situation had changed too like my dad was helping me through everything mm -hmm. and so with him passing uh peggy's family was amazing mm -hmm. and they took me in at that time so i moved into their house uh and i was able to just sort of like rebuild some some grounds for myself at least in terms of financial capability mm -hmm. and things like that to to sort of float but that was when peggy and i had started talking seriously about opening gadget bot because it was mm -hmm. sort of a way for us to just get off the ground uh, initially because we both had a lot of little projects that were coming in and that was sort of a way for us to funnel those projects so that we, like, because I was such an emotional wreck, she was able to take some of those and we were able to work off of each other and sort of balance our life uh, within that company yeah. um, at that time. And then it, it took the rest of 2011 for us to really build the foundations of the company mm -hmm. because we had known like a few years prior that we wanted to do this thing to create IPs, but the way we built the company came out more of a necessity, more of a need uh, initially. And then we realized, like, okay, we need to build these foundations going forward in order for us to have the future that we want um, mm -hmm. in the studio. You know, you know the, the interesting thing is um, when I'm hearing this is that you know, a lot of people are, you know, at least at the beginning, you know, doing their own sort of fan art or they're doing other work that, that they, they feel like, you know, like, all right, uh, you know, just to prove myself and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, we're very pro, you know, original art and original, you know, IP. But, you know, when you're that young, um, it's just amazing that, that you're, you know, like your first thing is to, I want to create my own IP. I mean, was that always something that you're like, for some reason, you just want to have something to say about, you know, your own worlds? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I... I think we talked about it in school. Yeah. And we were already kind of doing it in school because in school, you know, you get to make whatever, quote unquote, whatever you want, right? Like you, you choose a story and then like, but usually it's exi existing stories and you kind of change the visuals and mm -hmm. um, certain points you can make your own story because it's something like we asked the teachers, like, can, can we th pitch our own idea? And they're like, yeah, that's fine. So it wasn't discouraged. It was kind of one of the things like, okay, this is a great exercise. And it's like, yeah, it's always been kind of uh, definitely like something I've always wanted to do. And I think something you've always wanted to do too, like on your own as you grew up, right? Yeah. yeah. And I think um, 
that that has a lot to do with like references, things that we grew up with. Like for yeah. myself, I grew up with a ton of anime uh, mm-hmm. as a kid. I grew up with them right as they were coming out, and I didn't know that back then. So I grew up on uh, Cowboy Bebop. Mm-hmm. I grew up on Evangelion, which is quite dramatic and not great for like a nine or <laughs> ten year old. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, I <laughs> I grew up on uh, all those things, and so as as I was getting into sort of my, like the teenager years, I was I was hungry for more projects like that, but there actually wasn't a lot of them because Mm, um, mm. like I I love anime in general, but a lot of it goes too crazy. Like even for my, 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 my own sensibility, like it's hard to follow sometimes like Mm. the, the narrative, like where the characters are going stuff like that. But there was these certain ones to me that were just like gold standards. Like like I said, like Cowboy Bebop, Evangelion, um, all the Ghibli films, like growing up with those things, they, they really pushed me to want to create more projects like those. Um, Cause to me, like the art was high, like the standard, the mm-hmm. storytelling was really high. Yeah. Um, and so like a lot of the worlds that I was starting to develop were based within those sort of realities. Mm-hmm. Um, and going into like my art center years and things like that, I just, I needed to create more stories and I didn't want to base it off of anything else necessarily. Yeah. There's a few projects we did that in school, but a lot of the times we pitched our own stories and, and mm-hmm. created things. They weren't very good, but yeah. <laughs> it was That's at right. least a place to start and to mm-hmm. learn more about storytelling because I, my father, again, like going back to him, he was a storyteller to me as a kid. Like he would always tell me all sorts. I didn't necessarily pick up on that right away, even though I loved the stories that he was telling me. Mm. And so a lot of it was stuff that Peggy and I had to learn over the years. Yeah. I mean, we took uh, writing classes after yeah. Art Center, too, because, you know, you never want to stop what you're doing, right? It's like adding more to education. Like, even now, we don't stop. You still, we still, like, learn new things. And so, as, like, everybody does, um, it's just a way to keep adding to it. Because it's like, there's something really beautiful about seeing, like, what Miyazaki does, right? Because he just kind of, he comes up with these stories, he does the visuals, and, of course, there's a whole team wrapped around it. But it's just... I don't know. It's like such a great way to kind of encapsulate everything together. And that was something I was really inspired by even back then is like looking at Miyazaki, looking at these creatives, like they always had teams that they were working with. So it wasn't necessarily about them. It was about the team as a whole, like these stories that were being generated and created and everybody was coming together and suggesting the best ideas, like in terms of like the character standpoint, where their arcs were, things like that. Like it's it's something that we push a lot Mm. today own studio as well i think uh also uh, you know there's a lot of people like uh who's the one that created uh oh uh, district nine right that came out when we were in school oh, yeah, that no, was okay. mind-blowing because you know he was a visual effects guy and he just you know got to this point where he's working with weta and created this whole like film project and we're like that is so cool so i think the exposure the timing everything we were able to see all these things being created Again, like seeing Scott's studio, seeing like Kang create his thing. And Kang wasn't that much further in age from like us or at least a couple of years ahead. So you're like, oh, he's only a few years off. So, I mean, we were I think, very fortunate to be exposed. That's like the big part, being exposed to all these creatives. Yeah. So yeah. That, That's quite a different road, I think, you know, than most uh you know, like I know I, I, I was, you know, a studio guy for like 10 years before. I mean, I even went thought about free or oh, more than 10 years before I thought about freelance. I mean, that's not even my own company, but that's definitely a, a very different um, different way to see it. Now, I, I'm wondering, uh, so Robert, I mean, I totally get where you're coming from and, 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 and what sparked your need for IP. Uh, how about you, Peggy? I mean, like, that, you know, because I know Robert went through a lot of stuff that shaped him into, mm-hmm. you know, why he did that. How, how, what, what was that for you? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, definitely, like, it's a childhood thing, right? So growing up, I would always draw, I think we all did. But even at that time, I was making up comics, too. And I was like, I was like, I don't know why, but, you know, the daily, like, su- Sunday comics or even those daily comics you see, I was like, oh, this is really cool. This artist came with this world, this little story, and then just put it out. So that, to me, was, like, earliest inspiration. And then from there, it's, like, Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, and watching all these, it was, like, such a beautiful time, right? They had, like like this uh it was like golden their golden age version of, of projects that were coming out at the time and so that was really cool i was like i think because it's just seeing these unusual situations like ed ed and eddie you know it's like kids in a cul-de-sac and they're just coming up with these little stories or that you have something like um like hey arnold it's like kind of those same things are inspiration and then from there it's like i got a little older uh again like star wars was one I, it was in the 2000s i watched it and i was like this is this is from like a person you just come up with this idea because at the time i was really 
all I really saw more was more realistic type films or like TV shows. So to see something like that, it was so conceptual. And I was like, this really like, to me, that was the first kind of like indication. And then from there, it was like playing Diablo. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. You come up with a story. And then, so to me, it was always wrapping. The story part had to come first. And then the art had to go on top of that. Because if not, yeah, I don't yeah. know what I'm drawing. I was like, okay, if I, hmm. You know, you kind of like this monster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? It's like my my mind was always like, why? That was right. something you and I were very similar with, which is yeah. like a, a lot of our friends could just design anything out of the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. But for both of us, it felt like we always needed a narrative in order to mm -hmm. design the thing mm -hmm. at hand. It was, it, it's always been mind boggling to me when I see someone just design something out of nothing, which yeah, yeah. Is, is, is its own talent and is an extremely amazing one. Yeah. Uh, but it's not something that I was necessarily like able to do right off the yeah, bat. Yeah, it's just like, cause to me it's like, I can stop asking questions. I don't yeah. know what it is. It's like, yeah. I'll, like before I start something like, I'll start asking more and more questions. Kaidro, by the way, is one we're working on right now is massive. It's so much, it's like the iceberg thing. You see this, the top part, but we have so much lore under it just to make ourselves mm -hmm. feel like, okay, now I know what I'm drawing. This person's grandparents, 300 well, years that, old. That well, it just goes way too deep, but it's, it helps us. So it's a lot of yeah, fun. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. But I, I, how was the, the beginning days of gadget bot? I mean, was it easy, smooth sailing? Was it like super yeah. difficult? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, not super easy. I mean, like when we came out of school and then like, and you were working on different projects. Um, one of the things that one of the first projects we were got on was uh, Borderlands Two. Yeah. Right? The for doing a the very first thing we got out of Gadgetbot that was in 2011. Yeah. yeah. So they had us do like the sniper rifles, and so that was like good period of time where we were just designing yeah just like pieces because as you guys know now because borderlands 2 is already out they had just like come they'll tear your gun apart and put it back together in different ways with other guns yeah and so it, to be fair though it's like obviously you don't just get these jobs yeah. like for us the reason why we got that is uh we did the nothing but mech art book at yeah. that time too we knew a lot of the guys over at gearbox mm -hmm. um from doing that art book and so that gave us this opportunity to kind of let gadgetbot shine a little bit and yeah you know early days of Gadgetbot, it's like mm -hmm. I was 22, 21, you were yeah. 23, something Maybe like, like that. Maybe like 23, 24. So we had no idea what we were doing. Mm -hmm. That's just the straight of it. So yeah. it was like trying to figure out the business side of it and also mm -hmm. like trying to figure out how to be professional while you talk to these studios and, and yeah. figure all these things out. But it was very, um, it was very difficult mm -hmm. early on because it was, it, it, we needed to grow up was yeah. a big part of it while we were in the early stages of of creating this whole thing and mm -hmm. getting it off the ground. I think we did know though that it was going to take at least 10 years. Yeah. Like like where we are now it was like yeah, that's like 10 years we're like it's going to take a while. We knew it was going to be painful because it's like we knew it can come fast, but we knew we had to go hard at it for 10 years to even like get it to a steady place. Well, the company is like an entity. Mm -hmm. Um and with any entity like us as individuals, it always takes about a decade to get something going. Mm -hmm. um, like if you're putting all your force into it. And yeah. um, I think Anise brought this up last time, but it's like the the, the universe kind of uh, conspires with you to yeah. bring something to life if you're putting all your energy into it. And yeah. that is something I do agree with at a, a, a pretty large scale because anytime we put all of our energy into something, we usually get uh, a reaction Mm -hmm. uh back from that thing that we've created yeah but it takes time it's like yeah uh, I, I think it was also the, the whole 10 year part is like we knew there was gonna be a lot of failure i think that was definitely one of those yeah. things like you don't know how much how painful you don't know all the late nights you don't know about like you know just like things that don't work out or deals that could have been better or like things that you lost and you're like oh this is tough but you know that it's like you're working towards something it gets better incrementally you have to like really be aware of that um, but yeah, definitely it's, it's not a simple road and yeah, it's like anything. Right. So, so how long before you guys actually, Oh, sorry. Yandy, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. You can go first. You can go first. No, I mean, I, I, I'm just wondering how long before, like I, at the beginning, was it just more like, okay, whatever jobs we can get, mm -hmm. let's get yes. them. Uh, yeah. and then, but you know, let's keep writing these IPs that we have yeah. in mind and then. Yes you know, maybe pitch it at some appropriate time when we've, you know, like, is that the, the sort of the, the, the progression of gadget bot? I mean, you know, that's a good question. Um, do you want to cover that one? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is something we talked about early mm -hmm. on in the days of creating the company, but 
we knew that we didn't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. We didn't have family that had money. We had to make everything happen out of pocket uh, mm -hmm. for this company. And we always had a dream. They're like, oh, maybe we can find an investor one day that would just mm -hmm. make the studio go and we could create whatever project we want. That's what every artist wants. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the reality of it was is that the company was sort of like our master's degree. Mm -hmm. you know, we didn't finish art school and we didn't get a degree. Um, we weren't sure if that was going to hurt us or not. Yeah. We'll find out later on doesn't really matter in our field. Mm -hmm. um, but the 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 big thing was like we were willing to put whatever money we developed, yeah. uh, either through the film work we were doing or the random jobs, into ourselves back into the company. Yeah. Um, we weren't sitting on this like trying to buy a house or anything like that. We were just yeah. we were trying to put everything back into it to make it thrive mm -hmm. um and we created momentum first yeah so right yeah. when we created the company we also partnered with a friend of ours named mark yang mm -hmm. uh, from art center to create a short film called momentum yeah um that was like mm -hmm. a hover racing uh short that was like way too long we made it 12 minutes it should have been a lot shorter than that we mm -hmm. created other edits of it later on that were a little better yeah. out of that but that's what the learning experience was though is we went in hog wild we're like we're gonna create a vfx heavy thing yeah. we're gonna uh we're gonna shoot with red cameras which we've never done before we're gonna put together a team of 60 people which we've never done before yeah. um we're gonna go into three years of vfx production which we've never done before mm -hmm. um and of course we thought we were gonna do all these things super quick yeah but mm -hmm. it was all it, they're they're not failures because you learn from them they're mm -hmm. failures at the moment when you go through them because they're painful yeah. they hurt you spend a lot of money doing them mm -hmm. um, and you don't necessarily get the reaction that you were hoping for when you create that thing. Mm -hmm. um, but years later, we couldn't be doing what we're doing today without doing those things yeah. initially because we learned so much about production, time management, money, yeah. scripts, business. business. I mean, it's really, uh, it's like, it's funny because we were talking about it like way back. It was so uncomfortable to even talk to people, but you realize like if you want to make a movie, you got to talk to the, you know, you got to talk to producers, you got to talk to like actors, you got to talk to all these side actors too. And then there's just so many people involved that it's like, you have to come out of yourself because like, you know, as artists, we wanted to like, I knew yeah. I wanted to be like under a rock and draw, but at the same time, I was like, well, we're going to make stories that make them happen it takes a lot of people. And so it's like coming out of yourself and learning to talk to people was a whole other thing. And yeah. <laughs> our, our team still doesn't believe us to this day, but we were some of the shyest people you could have ever met in our yeah. school. Like we're here talking today pretty open because of all the experiences yeah. we've been through. But I mean, coming out of school, my, my dad had to talk to Scott Robertson yeah. the very first mm. time because I couldn't get myself to do it. I was so nervous. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> yeah, I, I, Peggy, did, uh, just I was just wondering. Did, so, Robert, you left on six at sixth term. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you leave as well, Peggy, or did you stay I, to finish? Or? Yeah, yeah. So then, uh, basically, I think you left around the because we had summer, so summer's usually off, and then it was fall, and yeah. you were out, so it was like a good half year out. And then for me, I was like, well, I was like, I'll go back in and see, you know, how much because you know, to me, it was still confusing, and I wasn't sure if I was going to finish myself. That was like a question everybody has. They're like, do we? finish school or do we just you know um go out and work and so I went back in um at the time and I was about halfway through and this is with Tim Flattery at the time this is like senior level classes so at this point you're just kind of taking your favorite things you know whatever like whatever you want to put in your portfolio they'll work with you to get it there um so I was during during that time uh, you were working at Ender's Game you were actually yes. in Louisiana and it's, and then I was still in school we had probably like part of the class was not work, uh, had left for work as well. Um, but then I got reached out to from this like company, uh, now they're Murata. Um, and they're like, oh yeah, you know, we like your robot work and you know, you work, you're going to work with a hope, a high profile director. We can't tell you what the project is. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> One of those. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I was like, uh, I was like, did I leave school? I'm like, oh my gosh, that sounds really cool. They're like, yeah, we have to have you start like Monday. It was like days away. And I was like, um, <laughs> Okay, uh, and I was like, well, I, I, I talked to Robert, I talked you to... You called me, yeah, because I was in Louisiana, yeah. and uh, we both were just geeking out, because yeah. we kind of knew a little bit about the company, and we're like, wait, yeah. could it be this project? Yeah. Like, could you be on this one? Yeah. Like, hold on. Yeah, and then it was like, so I was like, okay, whatever, I'm just going to dive for it, let's go, and so I told Tim, I was like, hey, Tim, I'm sorry, I'm like, this opportunity, I don't know, I, I think it's this project, but we'll see, and then so I go in, and it's, it's Pacific Rim. 
And so it's like oh, Murata was okay. working on the first 10 minutes of it. So they <clears> had plots <throat> in there. So they had me come in and help them with that. But it was like, I don't know how much I can say too much. But basically, it's like I see the wall of stuff. And I was like, what is this? You know, like this is before anybody knew about Pacific Rim besides like rumors of it. So it was like really mind blowing to see the stuff, the work, the art, everything coming together. It was so beautiful. And like he hearing feedback from like Remel del Toro, too. I was like, oh, shoot, cool. He likes this design. It was fun. So um, that was that was it. I, that's how I ended up leaving school. And then after that, I was like, okay, I guess, you know, I worked at a bunch of like ad agencies too. Again, we're still like, we had Gadgetbot, we had momentum that we were coming up, like working on still at that time. I think we were starting the idea. We're starting right? it. Yeah. yeah. So it was just, you know, Gadgetbot was created, but at the same time, it was still like we, us ourselves had to keep gaining more contacts because, uh, you know, we're so incredibly new. Yeah. So. Well, that's certainly a, a really good reason to leave. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jan, did you, I, I remember you, did you yeah, have yeah. something? Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I had a question about <clears throat> how to phrase it. Maybe maybe it's about the mental side of IP development and, and generally, yeah. but it be, because um, thinking about, well, hearing about the kind of people you are and, and how you approach uh, the company, the work and everything. I mean, you, you seem to be very much like, I'll like, we'll just do it. Um, there's a lot of yeah. people who, um, I mean, cool. there, there's no judgment from my side, what, which, which way of doing things is, is better, right? It's just anybody can live how they want. So some people, you kind of feel like life happens to them. It's like, oh, okay, so this project came along and I'll jump on that. And then I don't know, a couple of years later, this one, and then I moved there and then they're happy doing this right and and it's yeah. it's it's great whereas you have like you're like okay we're gonna do this and then we're gonna do this and then it feels incredibly um it, it feels incredibly well thought out of course there's a lot of struggle right but it feels like okay we'll do this and then we'll do this and then we need to do this this and this and to get there um but i'm 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 sure there was a lot of struggle and you already hinted at it um and it's not all smooth sailing right but I mean, there must have been intense periods over the last 10 years while you develop Kydro in terms of like, like, like probably getting close to the, to the, to the verge of like giving up and it's like, what is this? Like, oh, this is all garbage. Okay. Nobody is going to like that ever. Yeah. Why are we, why are we putting all our money and energy into that thing? Uh, can yep. you speak a little bit to that maybe? Yeah. Go first, or? yeah. I mean, definitely. I mean, I think, um, how you said you're like, oh, it seems really thought out how we got to where we are, but actually, it's it's really just a point, you know. It's like we know we want to have a studio, we know we want to create IPs, and we know we want to partner with um, these game studios and these film studios to make concept art for them. Um, so that's kind of the point. That was just like one point there, but it's like we knew, I don't know, we knew, but it's like you kind of that road is like this, right? It's like, you know, it's, it's mm. windy. There's takes you in places that you, you're like, why am I even, I think like when you're saying like the, almost like a depression side or the side of like the hardships of like, why am I even doing this? That's like, I don't know. That gets up to a bit like almost 80% of it. Yeah. Cause you're just like, people can't tell. You, you can't <laughs> yeah, tell yeah, yeah. because it seems like, oh, the stuff's coming out, but well, you're just like unsure still. Naivety <laughs> keeps you going for yeah. a time at least. So yeah. like when, and I'll, I'll try to break it down the best we could. We knew that we could create our own projects if the company made money. Mm -hmm. That was pretty much what our goal was. We're like, mm -hmm. if Gadgetbot can make money, we mm -hmm. can make whatever we can set our heart towards. Yeah. So in the early days, it was just about trying to get, you know, mm -hmm. these studios on to, to 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 build that financing capability. Mm -hmm. But it that proved to be its own challenge because yeah. again, how we talked about entities early on, no gadgetbot was a new name 10 years ago no mm. one knew what that was uh it, they thought we were some sort of app app based company because mm -hmm. our name was gadgetbot it had nothing to do with art <laughs> um and, and we'll get to the reason why it's called that later but um we uh we 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 just had to work and prove to these different companies and people that we met that Obviously, it wasn't just an entity. You were hiring Peggy and I, mm -hmm. and we both had a certain amount of knowledge and everything we had learned while we went through school and throughout all of our different experiences and people like that that we had met. Yeah. But there was so many failures even within the jobs. Um, you know, like one thing we try to do is not burn bridges. Like mm -hmm. that's this entire industry. You don't want to burn a bridge. Um, but sometimes it's inevitable. Mm -hmm. It comes up and uh, there's situations where you're like, I need to go do this thing. It'll make my life better if I do that. But it might not make this person happy. And the reason why I have to bring this up is 
we we had a lot of issues with cons uh, with with story development trying mm -hmm. to make it work. But yeah. before that was a thing, and before the depression of that stuff, there was also the depression of the client work. Mm -hmm. And so there were certain projects like um, Fantastic Four, uh, the last one that had come out. Um, uh, my relationship with the team there wasn't too good because I had to fly out to Louisiana again for another six months. And Peggy and I are, are great together. When mm -hmm. we're apart, it's very difficult. Um, and that's just with any relationship, it makes it strained mm -hmm. um, because we're trying to create things and create projects. And so that was a project that I was willing to burn to come back. And that changed everything for us mm -hmm. when we did that, because yeah. it allowed us to rethink of things like how could we do it back here in California and not have to go everywhere and really try to structure this company. Yeah. And so we started working with different game studios yeah. and we started building relationships over a couple of years with those different game studios. And that's what gave us leverage finally, because it was a longer term thing. It was a longer term engagement and reaction mm -hmm. with them. And as an individual, they realized you're also running that company. And so we'd say, oh, instead of just having me as one artist, how about I bring two or three other artists and help you on this project if you need that help and we'll be guiding this thing. And so that allowed the company to grow in increments. It allowed mm -hmm. it to grow in, in certain sizes. Yeah. Um, but when we started to get into developing our own stories and mm -hmm. our own projects, we took all that, all that effort, all that time we had spent, like trying to get those client projects and the money and everything like that. And, uh, we were investing it back into the company, yeah. but through that investment, you know, there's certain times where you're just burning, like you're mm -hmm. just burning cash, you're burning things, like just trying to figure out what we were trying to create at that time. And that's yeah. where a lot of the depression came from. Yeah. Because like you said, like you're putting money into this thing, you're trying to see if it's working and you also have to make more money in the background in order to keep those ideas and those things going, mm -hmm. um, overall. And you don't know when it's going to play out. Mm -hmm. Like, is it ever going to play out? Like I've, I've witnessed family members develop projects their entire lives and nothing ever happened. Mm -hmm. And so I had my own trauma, like coming up against this stuff, like seeing mm -hmm. things uh, come to fruition that we were developing. Mm -hmm. um, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, too? I mean, definitely. Like, I think you hit the nail on the head. Like failure is always in the back of our minds. Like, yeah. oof. Like you go as hard as you can, but obviously you feel great. And then it's like some days you're like, hmm. You're like, oh, I might just like, is it worth it? You don't know. And definitely we've had projects that just crashed and burned in the last 10 years for sure. And we're yeah. definitely like, I didn't even know we wanted to, like, I think we got to the point where we didn't even want to make IPs almost. We are like, is this even worth it? This is so painful. 2018. Yeah. 2018 was the year that we almost shut down GadgetBot. Mm -hmm. um, 2018, we, we, a lot of the projects we were working on, like client wise, mm -hmm. stuff like that had all dived down. Mm -hmm. at that time and we had money that we were just floating on but it wasn't much mm -hmm. and we could, we didn't have enough room to develop a project in any direction yeah and so we're like what do we do like mm -hmm. at this time like we can't create anything this is kind of the purpose of what we want to do yeah um and a little bit of that was waiting mm -hmm. like we waited around enough i think until about 2009 that uh, 2019 yeah that one of our clients they needed us to crew up to something quite large mm -hmm. um, that was unexpected. Uh, and Peggy and I just said yes right away without mm -hmm. even thinking too much. It was more like, okay, we'll just figure this out like once we get this thing. Yeah. And then that, oddly enough, became a snowball effect and mm -hmm. just kept going and hasn't stopped since then. Yeah, it's been going pretty hard since then. I mean, I think also it's like even that time of that client work, I mean, IP-wise, we weren't even making anything at that no. point where we kind of stopped. We're like, uh, okay. I mean, we're, we're passing over a lot of things here, mm -hmm. but basically in 2011 to 2015, we created momentum. Mm -hmm. We finished it all the way through. We weren't necessarily super happy with it, mm -hmm. but we had learned a lot from developing that project. And we were pitching it around too. We were. We yeah. pitched it to a ton of different studios. Everybody told and, us. And it was a, what was this? I mean, short exactly. Film. Mm -hmm. Momentum. Okay, so, short film. Okay. so short film, but we did not have a good understanding of story structure at the mm -hmm. time. So it was purely just a hover racing mm -hmm. concept arty project. Like yeah. it was pretty looking, mm -hmm. it was really cool, but there was no substance mm -hmm. to it at the end of the day. And so we created a second project a uh, project called Connection. Mm -hmm. And Connection was something that Peggy and I had done purely ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, we wrote everything. Uh, we created all the concept art. We did everything. And so we worked with a lot of friends in the industry to pull together a crew 
of about 60 people mm -hmm. and we flew everybody out to uh Oregon. to Oregon to yeah. film the entire thing and that also wow. turned out to be a failure mm -hmm. uh, and that was a really big failure on our side it's something we still want to get back around to because we have all the footage uh, for the project, but there was weird mishaps that happened on the project. Like one of our DIT guys uh, didn't record sound for some of the projects we were, so for some of the recording we were doing, so we lost a ton of stuff there. Yeah. So we yeah. piecemealed a film together out of it. Yeah. But uh, I wasn't strong enough in my capabilities to bring the 3D side of it to life, mm -hmm. and we had just spent everything filming the project. And so I wasn't able to uh, hire friends to bring mm -hmm. them on to help out with the project. So we put it on ice mm -hmm. in the background. Um, and we're just, it, that was a very emotional time because, you, you know, Peggy and I are a couple. Mm -hmm. And so each of these projects we create are kind of, a, it's a child. Mm -hmm. It's a kid for us. So like losing that project and having it go down, it hurts us deeply mm -hmm. because we put everything into that for at least a couple of years, like developing the idea of the story and trying to figure out where we're going to go with it. But we had a weird opportunity pop up in 2016 to 2017, mm -hmm. which is Nomen, uh, because we had done uh, a talk at Nomen about momentum. They were offering us uh, interns from Nomen that could come work at Gadgetbot. Um, and we also had the same thing from, uh, was it USC? Yeah. It was from USC. USC. It was from yeah. USC. They were offering programmers. They had a new program they were for, uh, formatting that was internships there too. And they wanted to get uh, programmers out into uh, studios. And so Peggy and I were like, look, we have one more project. Because these schools are willing to work with us, it might not cost us too much mm -hmm. to do from our end. But like, why don't we just try to develop Kydro? Mm -hmm. And so we developed Kydro as a VR game yeah. with these different schools. And we didn't know anything about VR. We just knew storytelling. We knew world building. Um, and so we developed a VR demo mm -hmm. in six months. No, it was less than that, actually, four months. Yeah. In four months, no one else had developed one at this level at mm -hmm. the time, too. And we were able to bring it to VRLA and E3 uh, at that time because the VRLA people loved us with what we were creating. They helped bring us to E3 at that time, too. Mm -hmm. um, and it just it allowed to get it allowed the star studio to get a lot more attention from mm -hmm. that point mm -hmm. of view. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. itself, like the, the VR project also didn't get to come through at the end of the day. It's still something we're holding on to in our back pocket right now, mm -hmm. but it allowed for other studios to see what we were capable of because Gadgetbot suddenly uh, within like four months became a full production uh, outsourcing studio mm -hmm. for game studios. We were able to do 3D development, concept art, mm -hmm. uh, rigging, animation. We did all those things within four months. And um, it, it was it's quite beautiful. Like a lot of our team members went off to Pixar after that mm -hmm. to do uh, full-fledged animations because of their portfolio out of that project. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them went off to Call of Duty uh, with Treyarch, a lot of the studios we work pretty close to. Yeah. Um, so it gave a lot of them uh, kind of their first foreway into the, the industry, mm -hmm. but also gave our studio the platform it needed to kind of go above and beyond where it had been at for the last couple of years, what we were trying to create. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of team building, right? It's a lot of it's like learning about management and team building. Mm -hmm. And it's like at this point, even this year, we're like working on finishing the, the VR project. Yes, So, and that's where things kind of come back around is mm -hmm. like at the end of 2017, we weren't able to finish the VR project again because the, the students that we had on couldn't get the project so far. And Peggy mm -hmm. and I didn't have the financing to take it all the way for what we were doing. So it became their portfolio piece. Mm -hmm. But for Peggy and I, it was more like, okay, let's try to really get the investment. And so we went to investor after oh, investor pitching, after yeah. investor for months. The entire year, we were pitching our hearts out to mm -hmm. bring the project to life. And by 2018, we had another VRLA. We had almost no money. Mm -hmm. but we were like, let's just take this thing to VRLA again and pitch it. And no investors, no nothing came out of it. But we had a weird opportunity to go to China mm -hmm. uh, yeah. at that time. And so Peggy and I took that opportunity. And the opportunity was to go and pitch to investors in China and to mm -hmm. uh, pitch to studios mm -hmm. and things like that out there. Yeah. And again, nothing came yeah. of all that. But what did come from it was connections, meeting mm -hmm. people. Um, we built a lot of good friendships out of that trip when we mm -hmm. went out there. And, you know, that's going into 2019 and 2020, everything kind of flipped for mm -hmm. us 180 because 
all these contacts, everybody kind of built to like a boiling point with all yeah. the things we were creating. And finally, people were coming to us and saying, hey, like Gadgetbot, they're a full uh, game studio, right? Mm -hmm. Like they can create assets and mm -hmm. concept art and stuff like that. And so we started putting all those contacts together that we had from the different schools and stuff like that we'd worked and Gadgetbot started to grow out of that. And mm -hmm. so in the last three years, Gadgetbot really grew from just Peggy and myself and doing all these little experiments to a team of 40 to 50 now. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. at, and uh, we're constantly r and new ideas and new projects and things like that too. But we're also bringing the old projects back to life too. Yeah. Um, sure. So like one half, we have like one whole half of the team is just working on the comics and mangas for the Kydro project now. And we're going full steam ahead with those. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we also have the VR game getting new life uh, breathes back into it. Yeah. So I mean, what the is Kydro? I mean, I mean, you know, like the, you, yeah. we were hearing how this was pitched, but yeah, yeah. and sure. it was pitched as a as a VR game, right? Mm -hmm. initially. Yeah, initially, initially it was pitched. As but a VR what is game, it? But... What is it now? <laughs> so Kydro from the very beginning was not just a VR game. Mm -hmm. It was a project that Peggy and myself, it, it's been around for at least 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, back when I was a teenager, I started to just play around with this idea of kids with mechas uh, fighting. This wasn't anything like original. It was just like I, I had these relationships I wanted between these characters, but that was about it. Um, when Peggy and I had met, we started to, mm -hmm. it was really hard for me because I was, you know, we're young. So mm -hmm. it was all ego at that time. It was very hard to like divulge the project. So Peggy and I were developing things separately. But mm -hmm. after my dad had passed away, that was when we finally came together about yeah. Uh, with Kydro, and it used to be called Battle Club. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and when we came together, that's when the project got really special. Mm -hmm. So Kydro itself is a sci-fi fantasy uh, action project. Uh, and the world itself follows this character named Ava. And uh, Ava herself uh, has always dreamt of going to the Mech Academy uh, uh, as a kid and up to a young adult, who she is now. Um, and that opportunity is sprung upon her one day when a vehicle that she's lived on her entire life called a Leviathan in this sci-fi world that we built that holds about 300 people. Mm -hmm. Think of it kind of like the, the, the uh, what's that ship called an alien? Uh, Nostromo. The Nostromo. Think yeah. of it as kind of the Nostromo. It's this massive vehicle, but instead of it being in space, it drives across the surface of this planet and it's mm -hmm. refining resources and things like that that it comes up against. And one day that vehicle is attacked by someone named the Outlander Radical. Mm -hmm. And it completely throws Ava's life apart. Her loved ones uh, and her grandmother are both killed on the ship while she's fleeing for her life to get off of this thing. Mm -hmm. And then she's launched into this crazy new world uh, of the Mech Academy. But she's also pulled deeper into uh, the spiritual side yeah. of herself and what the world is around her. And so a lot of that came out of my dad passing away and sort of crazy trippy dreams and things I had gone through after he had left me uh, and us. And that all got poured into Kydro mm -hmm. as a world and story. And that's kind of what brought the, the the magic sauce into the story. It wasn't just this sci-fi world. It was this character exploring herself and her uh, deep psyche uh, and the things that were going on around her and the things that interest Peggy and I too. We're really yeah. interested in, in uh, just psychological and uh uh it's the coming of age yeah right? it's like so, coming of age stories i think this is a lot like similar to what we were talking about earlier like we came up with momentum but it was so surface level because we were like we should not hover vehicles but like this one got to the next level because we were playing with the idea but we knew it was it was missing something when we took those writing classes they were like you know there's you have to write something but it has to come from like experience from life and we're like okay but you know when you're young you don't have that much experience so it's like mm -hmm. but then then unfortunately you have really traumatizing experiences you're like okay i have <laughs> things to like throw into this now okay so um i think over the years we've been like keep adding more and more to it because so much of it is that coming of mm -hmm. age the learning right so yeah. she over has to overcome a lot of things like ego is a big one you know like us going from a younger age to an older age you have to overcome yourself getting out getting out of your own way so we kind of cover a lot of that stuff throughout her mm. whole journey. And right now we're like episode one out of six. Out of six for the first season. Yeah. So when you say episode one, um, are you developing, what? What is, what is it that you're developing now? I mean, is it a show? Is it a, yeah. what, I mean, what is it? 
Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, we've been through a lot with Kaidro, so we've always developed it as a series, like mm -hmm. an actual show. Mm -hmm. um, we've done the storyboards, we've done the script writing, we've done everything, and we've yeah. like a live action, animated animation. Mm -hmm. um, we've okay. never gone the route of live action. That's what our studio does, mm -hmm. design wise. But we've never done that because you'll be kicked right off of that as a creative, yeah, uh, in a heartbeat because there's just there's no standing. It's, you have to prove that you've filmed or you've created something that has garnered some sort of attention mm -hmm. from the animation side. It's a little easier for us to step into that realm, but still quite difficult yeah. like everything else. Um, and so uh, Kaidro itself, we've written it as a television series. It's yeah. three seasons long. Each mm -hmm. season is anywhere from six to about 10 episodes. Mm -hmm. um, for the sake of our company, what we can produce, we're going to do six episodes every season. Mm -hmm. That means we just have to rearrange things and get them structured a certain way for that. Yeah. Um, but uh, we've always come out with the idea that this is going to be a living, breathing world in animation one day. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is when it came to pitching this idea, the world itself is really, it's, it's at a Game of Thrones level in terms of the amount of interactions all these individual characters go through in this world. Uh, and so pitching that isn't very easy. You need something of substance behind it. Uh, that shows that people are interested in this world mm -hmm. rather than just coming at and, and, and pitching it to a person uh, at a studio. Yeah. Um, so we, we we partnered with another studio, uh, what, 2019? Yeah, I think so. It was yeah. when our studio started to, to kick up a little bit. And so mm -hmm. we partnered with another studio in 2019 to develop Kydro as an animation series. And so mm -hmm. we were doing different pitches with them. We were mm -hmm. setting things up. Nothing was really going anywhere until one day there was a, a pretty large investment that was coming into their studio uh, for Kydro and for mm -hmm. a few other projects that they were developing. And so pe for Peggy and I was like, oh my God, this is finally, after all these years, after, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. whatever we've been developing at this thing, it's, we might have a chance to actually bring this thing to life. And right at that moment, that was when this production the studio side, decided to strip Peggy and I of all of our titles mm -hmm. from Kydro. So all we were going to get was created by, but everything else we were looking for showrunner, uh, we were looking for writer, we were looking for uh, at least producing mm -hmm. something that gave us some sort of skin in the game. Because if you don't have these titles, it's very easy to be kicked off of the project at some point uh, and for it to get taken over. Mm -hmm. um, and so when this happened, Peggy and I fought with them for a bit to try to get ourselves back on to the showrunner's side. Mm -hmm. But after they weren't able to do that, we decided to leave. Mm -hmm. And when we left, we uh we we owed a lot <laughs> yeah but we had to buy it back we had to buy the project there's development back done on it so yes um i'm sorry yeah i mean you know we ourselves had invested so much time into the world already and it was like okay man like we we have to take this back and just you know let's just go from here so we got it back it was very very crazy time at the time too it was really like um well what it was, was at the it? beginning of 2020 yeah well like was it the beginning of 2020? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right so, Right before the, it was weeks before the pandemic. We actually. literally bought it right before the pandemic hit. <laughs> I think it was like a week. Like yeah. bought, so. meaning, you know, you just come yeah. out, kind of, they said, look, a, you know, f for you to have this back, it's going to cost this it's much. It's going to cost yeah. you this much because we put Man. this much time into yeah, it. Which yeah. They honestly did very little. Like mm -hmm. we did all the concept art, but they still did own things mm -hmm. from yeah. the project at the end of the day like little story things they might have added which mm -hmm. a lot of their stuff is more from a script standpoint it was already stuff we had in our world they just kind of rearranged it mm -hmm. to fit what they wanted it to be but peggy and i knew at this point because we've done other pitches we're like oh we're just we're getting screwed at yeah this point. Like, we, we need to take this thing back and we need to just start it mm -hmm. and so we bought the project back we didn't put it on ice right away we no. we sat yeah. with it and we're like, look, like we've never done this before, but let's just bring it to life mm -hmm. ourselves um, at a very realistic level. Yeah. And so that's why we decided to make the mangas of, of yeah. Hydro. We take all the story, take the episodes that we built as is and mm -hmm. flush them out into these full comic book mm -hmm. um, projects that we have now. Um, and, and to touch upon the whole like IP development thing and like you know, the previous projects, we talked about how we had had to put them on ice. Because it was like the financial thing, right? We couldn't finish it. So when we were like, okay, if we're going to do this, we have to yeah. make sure we can be able to finance it and that it'd be done. I think we had talked about that before. It's like a lot of like people, artists that want to create their projects, but it kind of like 
dies out because you don't know where to take it or how, how what's the end and so that was what happened with the the vr game and the also for the other film it was one of those things we didn't have an end to it we didn't give like a date of like okay we need to be done and we need to have the money to make sure it's ready to be done so this was like the first one to actually like finish and actually we were get looking out. to be as as calculated with it as possible without selling out quote yeah. unquote. and what i mean by that is like we have a lot of friends that create projects and sell them the same way we all do with concept art. Yeah. Like Peggy and I, you know, we create a ton of art and we sell it every mm -hmm. single day with everybody mm -hmm. in our team. But we never wanted to get to that point with story development. Mm -hmm. um, and so with this, we decided to make the most calculated move we could with the story, which is uh, a year prior, we had started on TikTok of all places mm -hmm. <laughs> as a platform to grow our social media. Yeah. Um, and the reason why we started there was because everybody was, honestly, everybody was making fun of it. Right mm -hmm. off the bat, they're like, oh, that dancing app. Yeah. And uh, when I started to hear people make fun of it, all I had was backflashes to Instagram. And YouTube. And YouTube, because yeah. like, when those platforms first came out, everybody made fun of them mm -hmm. right off of the bat. And so Peggy and I were like, okay, let's get on TikTok and just start doing fan art, which is the first time we've ever done that before. Mm -hmm. I just, I needed to become noticed on some level for these projects that we were creating. Yeah. And so within months we suddenly were growing a platform from zero to like 500,000 people mm -hmm. uh within a couple of months because there was nobody there was no other artist there was no other concept artist at that time on the platform yeah um and suddenly we had all these eyes on Kydro. Mm -hmm. um and so we decided like okay i think this is the way for us to finally bring this to life let's just use social media to bring this project and so we yeah. decided to make a webtoons we decided to uh, culminate everything from TikTok, from Instagram, all that into Webtoons. So that way it would funnel everybody through the story that we were creating. And now, you know, three months later, the Webtoons is almost at 30,000 people yeah. on its own over there um, and almost 500,000 page views mm -hmm. in that time too. So it's it's allowing people to finally interact with the world at a level that we could never do before and that we were always looking to do. Yeah, I think there's a, something that you brought up too that's really important with the whole developing your own IP. And, and the thing is, the reality is that we need to create IPs, you need people to actually be interested in it too. And that was the failures, again, from the past. We're like, oh, we created these things, but we're like, we don't have the audience. Nobody knows that we're making these things. And so it's like, if you're creating something, you're putting it out there and it kind of like, pfft, it's like it goes into the air and you're like, oh, all right. Uh, nobody saw it, I guess. So this was like, okay, let's get more calculated about it. And we're like, let's just, you know, what do other people do? It's like YouTubers, they create an audience and then they, they bring out something else, they bring some like a product out. And so we're like, okay, let's just take that route. And yeah. so we ended up, yeah, doing the TikTok part. And, you know, it's like, it's been really interesting because we actually take we have contests that we run on TikTok too to be in the comic, which is really fun because people are throwing lore back at us now. So they're like came, coming up with characters from the world and like yeah. with factions, and this is like the dream. So I was like, oh man, this is crazy. They have like full character sheets and they have, they draw their own characters, and we're like, oh, this is. And they'll pick a faction and work their characters into that faction yeah. in the world. Too. And they'll like fight other people too. They're like, no, they're like mine is the best, and we're, just, and we're like, this is really fun. So it's like. Being able to bring the audience in on the work too has been like a really special thing to see and just kind of going with the times, like seeing like what's working now and like let's just let's just see what happens from there. So, mm -hmm. so it's a it's it's now a comic. Yeah. Like a yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. That uh, because I it was first kind of a like a TV mm -hmm. animation yes. thing and then now it's. Yeah turn into sort of this comic with the episodes and okay all right yeah. Yeah. interesting but I mean, the comics are, yeah. are are still written like episodes mm -hmm. uh the way they're laid out so like the the if we ever went in for uh, a pitch one day for the actual series mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's all laid out there with how yeah. each of those episodes are written i actually think it would get more dense if we get to the animation stage right now mm -hmm. it's, it's like we kind of to cut it down a bit to fit sort of the comic portion but definitely if it goes to like a 20 minute 30 minute kind of animation it'll go mm. definitely more cool. dense um but like like we said like that whole production studio we weren't able to make a you know the right kind of deal for it to go for as animation but the reason why we made it as a comic was there's no way like monetarily like because we did all the calculations and we're like okay no we can't make the animation on our own but we could do the comic like still images so so Let's say let's say somebody in the audience and our audience here is incredibly inspired by um, what you do. Maybe not to a level where he wants to uh, create his own characters for Kaidro, but take it up a mm -hmm. notch and and 
let's say, hey, I have my own ideas for an IP. I mean, would yeah. you, what would you recommend them? Would you recommend, I mean, be because everybody wants to sell their idea to Netflix or mm. Amazon, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Everybody wants to see like, oh, I want, I want Brad Pitt as the main character and want to make a Hollywood production out of it. And they don't, they don't accept anything below that, right? And they go mm. around pitching. And of course, chances are you get rejected, right? In 99 out of one out of 100 cases. But yeah. I mean, would you, would you recommend people to make an IP and, and focus on releasing it themselves in a way that they know they can achieve? Or do you still think that people should aim really high to like get a potential massive payoff, even though, I mean, it's really, really rare that that happens. Like, what would you recommend yeah. them now with all the knowledge you have? Mm -hmm. Hmm. It's, it's a good one. I think you should always aim for where your heart wants to go, like mm -hmm. where your goals like our goal is still an animation one mm -hmm. day the comic it's it's not even like a it's not even like a, a step down for us because we're getting to live and breathe with the world and the story it's just our end goal is that animation at yeah. the end of the day and you always have to have a goal after the goal in order mm -hmm. to keep growing the thing that you're trying to create mm -hmm. um for the audience i would say set your expectations as high as you can but as you are developing this thing and as you are talking to people and as you're pitching this thing, also try to be a bit more realistic with yourself. What is possible? What can you actually do to bring this thing to life at the end of the day? Because then you can take baby steps to get to that end goal. And to us, the comic is just another one of those baby steps. Mm -hmm. It's like we didn't just stop here. Like we have so many more episodes we are going to bring out for the actual comic itself. And we have... Uh, uh, actual animation test that we're starting to run within our studio itself mm -hmm. uh, to see what we can actually do at an actual animated level. Yeah. Um, I personally, personally, I don't believe too much in the actual pitching stage anymore. That's only because we have a studio mm -hmm. that has the resources in order to create its own content now at the end of the day. And so for Peggy and I, it's more just making better educational guesses mm -hmm. going forward with the company saying like okay we can allot this many resources to develop this thing now but we kind of got what we wanted initially a few years ago when we said we wanted a financer to help create our projects well we are now our own financer with the studio um so i think everybody everybody will get there in their own way not any one way is the way to get there um, and we have lots of friends that pitch projects all the time and sell mm -hmm. them but those projects uh, become a lot like our concept art. You'll mm -hmm. create a ton. You'll probably have to toss away like 95% of them mm -hmm. and the other 5% you actually get picked up and stuff like that. But it takes years for those projects to get going. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it's when I keep thinking about like IPs and I think the actually the one of the ones that I like seeing is when people put it out as a book, even though they print their own yeah. book. I mean, similar to what we're doing now, it's like we're printing it out as a book and it, it's just like a way to get your world out because like, can you not just do like a bunch of concept art and then like have like just a whole other side of just the written side? Like you don't even have to write it yourself, but either way, it's like being able to get, it depends where you want to go. Do you want to go storytelling route? Do you want to be a director? Do you want to be a production designer? Do you want to like art direct? It's like so many different avenues and there's so many possibilities, but a book I think is the one of the most feasible things to do if, you know, it's up to you how big you want to make it and how big your story is. But I feel like that's like one of those routes that are, I don't know. I think I feel achievable because it's like, it's always like way harder than you think. Like yeah. definitely like making a book is not easy either. I'm, I'm just saying like, whatever it is that you want, it's like, you kind of have to be so incredibly into it that you are willing to go through the painful parts because it's like, great. It feels great on a good day, but on a day that you're, you're down and you don't want to work on it. It's like, we, we have that really like I mean, super down. And we're just like, oh, I just gotta, I mean, just gonna keep going. 99% of the time it's going to be pain. Yeah. Like, it's just the truth. Like it's, uh, unless you have a family member that is connected to some studio mm -hmm. or a friend that is connected to some studio and they're able to bring light to a project that you are creating and it mm -hmm. just so happens to match exactly like, hey, I need a project with yeah. an elf. Your project has yeah. an elf. I love that project. Like Let's go make that thing. Yeah. Like I've heard that, not the elf thing, yeah. but I've heard that so many times mm -hmm. though, which is like, it's just, mm -hmm. you know, having the right connection and being the right point to bring that thing to life. But to be honest, the projects we're creating, the things that we want to see, isn't necessarily something these studio execs want to see at the end of the day. Kind of like one of the most, um, not the most popular 
you know, like categories to it, like yeah. sci-fi. It's not the most like lucrative one, like for them. But there yeah. is a following and fan base that is out there. You just yeah. have to go find them. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I was gonna it's just that. interesting. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. I, no, I have I have a question to that. Yeah. I mean. And I, I don't know if it's a question or if it's just a remark or something, because it's, I mean, you keep talking about anime, you keeping, you keep talking about manga and that, that in itself is a very niche fringe market. Mm. It might be, it might, I mean, even in Japan, um, as, as, I mean, from an, from an outside standpoint, you think that, oh, all Japanese watch manga and anime. Yes. No, they don't. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. It's, yeah. it's still a fringe thing there. It's still, a, and the thing is also right you keep calling it that instead of like a comic book a graphic novel or whatever yes. right so i mean what what's your what's your take on and your outlook on like yeah anime manga created outside of japan for a global audience like you mm. keep talking about webtoons webtoons are incredibly wow. popular in korea where pretty much like half of all new hit dramas in korea are based on webtoons yeah. um and and also like um like how how do you how do you feel how do you feel about this international um like it, it, it is a cross-border project in a sense right yeah. that you take ideas yeah. from japan or from korea and put them in, put your own spit on it like are you looking into different markets to publish are you looking at different yeah. is that we inspiring you a- like yeah we actually have a Korean version of Kydro Rolling over on the Korean webtoons. Oh, yeah. nice. So uh, all of manga one is being translated all the time mm-hmm. over to the, 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 the Korean one. Yeah. Um, I mean, the way we're coming at it, and it's, it, it is a very niche thing. And I think for, for me, too, as a fan, I, I would rather lean into the niche mm-hmm. even more than try to cover the whole thing uh, as a massive bubble. Or, 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 or try to spread it as far as I can. And the reason for that is it makes it more unique and it also causes a little bit more conversation between people uh, on what you're creating. Because if we create something and just say like, oh, Kydro is a comic, uh, full color, here you go, it's not as exciting. And that's just something we've learned through pitching and creating these projects. Like for yeah. me, it's calling it a manga will upset some people at mm-hmm. the end of the day, um, but for me, that's also a part of my heritage, which sounds really weird, but I, I, I grew up with that stuff more than I did anything American. You know, for me, it's like I, I would rather lean into that because I, I love that world and that culture uh, mm-hmm. around these types of stories. Um, and so that's that's why Kydro is, we, we call it that, we phrase it that, we push it in that direction. Yeah. And we also try to get it into other Asian markets like Korea. Mm-hmm. We're trying right now to get it into Japan uh, yeah if we can as well and that just means we have to set up more systems Mm -hmm. uh in order to get it translated and to get it put out there in that way but we have actually a lot of people on webtoons that are from japan too yeah um we we see it go all over the place yeah i mean overall the reception is in accepting i haven't really seen people kind of like gatekeeping it or anything so yeah and like to me it's like i'm i'm all for it i mean just creation in general like creators across the board like outside of japan creating you know like mangas and stuff Yeah. yeah All, all for it because why not we love this stuff so i want to see more of it so it doesn't have to be a very specific like it doesn't have to come out of japan you know so i'm excited for that yeah and i mean going back to like what a manga is that mm-hmm. word is strictly you know mm-hmm. towards japan it's strictly yeah. towards it's basically their form of a comic book mm-hmm. and same thing with calling like a u.s made animation an anime mm-hmm. an anime is just a cartoon mm-hmm. in in japan um but for me, there's a little bit more flavor around the project actually calling it those things, mm-hmm. at least from like an American standpoint, mm-hmm. because we grew up with those, um, like you know, on Toonami late at night and yeah. uh, different things as a kid, and that's what inspired me. So to me, it's just, it's a, it's a part of the flavor of the project and why it's important. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's great. That's great. I mean, um, now that I want to talk a little bit about um, the, the the studio structure right now. I mean, you say you have like 40, 50 people. That's that's like crazy so i mean yeah. who, who are you looking for like um are you looking for people across the board are you still involved mm. in like full-scale like game asset development mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. What, what are you looking for when you when you're looking to grow the team since you said sometimes you have to grow it quickly right mm. um, yeah yeah so what we've done is peggy and i always took the structure of growing the 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 and i'm sorry i'm speaking so much Let me oh no you're good say anything. Yeah, um we, we took this approach with the company, and this is after many years of us trying things, because we, we just throw things at the walls and see what would stick. 
But this time we're like, let's just take it in baby steps mm -hmm. and as fast as we can in baby steps, but in baby steps. And so initially, like a lot of these studios, it's just pitching them the concept art phase. But then later on, as we get a little bit more in, we show them our VR game. We're like, look, we did game assets. We've created game assets for other studios as well. How would you be interested in us doing it? And so that goes from one artist to five artists to six artists. Mm -hmm. Whatever their needs are, we kind of grow and change into that. And it wasn't it wasn't always the case. It's it's become more of it over the last like yeah. couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, but more recently, we've had to grow a lot faster. And through these baby steps, we trained certain people that we brought on. So mm -hmm. like initially, we had a core of, if you go back to beginning of, or at the end of 2019, we had like three or four concept artists that were at the company. Yeah. But Peggy and I trained them with everything we had. Mm -hmm. We lost one of them, but we still had like three of them mm -hmm. at the same time. And, and uh, they were their own people. They still have their own things, but they also have a lot of knowledge that Peggy and I were able to endow in them. And the whole idea and the concept of that was is as the company grows, they're going to take that same knowledge that Peggy and I gave them and they're going to spread that on to the next artists that come on too. And so we did that with each sector of the company. We worked very closely with those people. We don't necessarily get to work as closely with all the new people that come on, but the people we worked with help spread that knowledge to those people. And then we do whatever we can to step in there. But to be honest, like as the company grows to what it is now, we don't mm -hmm. talk to every single person every day like we used to. Yeah. We do our best to talk to everybody like once a month, like each individual person. Mm -hmm. We do like big group calls like every Monday. Mm -hmm. or something like that to get everybody together and and get that energy of the studio together yeah um but a lot of it was just taking it in baby steps and making sure that this core group of people understood what we were trying to do and what the values of the company were and then that would spread to the next group as that group came in and we just yeah. you would keep enlarging it that same way yeah i mean the thing is with each individual person that does come on though we do we're the ones that do interview them so we may have somebody else that interviews first and that's a newer thing that we have, but we, we ourselves will talk to them as well because again, like the things that, you know, you're asking like, what are we looking for? You know, the biggest, there's different things, right? There's skill sets, being able to do the, you know, the work, you know, something like characters or weapons, that's a huge one, right? So it's like one category, they could do character, they could do, or they can do weapons or they can do both. Um, and then the other side is the personality. I think, you know, when we meet people, we, you know, again, it's just through Zoom at this point. But when you talk to them, it's like we need to know if they have like a do they have like an ego problem. That's like one of the biggest things. You know, it's like if they can take direction. You know, whether they're you know newer or they're a little older, like as in like how long they've been in the industry. That's definitely like a big one for us because it can obviously everything is about the team, and it's like you don't realize how big of an effect one person has on a lot of people, which yeah. is odd, right? Just like one the, the whole one bad apple you know, messing up the whole batch actually is really real. And so we're really careful about um, bringing people on because if the personality or the attitude isn't right, it kind of messes with the whole system that we have like built up and kind of the, the ideals. Again, like what Robert said, we have, you know, several people, employees, a big group of them, the employees actually, like they understand what we are looking for because we bring it up all the time. It's like attention to detail is massive presentation like the work that's sent in like before they send in and like double triple check guys like there's not like some floating letter or some like you know you didn't label the work or ask questions yeah. questions about the world that this thing is coming from questions yeah. about why this thing exists mm -hmm. um it... storytelling i think that's yeah. one of the things we emphasize in our studio and it's like and it shows up in the work like we hope it does and then like that's what we emphasize when we before the work goes out we're like why does this character have like a why do they have these kind of pants and why is that area torn up? It doesn't make sense. So we have to make sure like they, like we push them we're like, Hey, you know, like what is the story you got? You have to pitch to us. Like what's, why does this character have this thing? So it's like a lot of the time it's like bringing the, en en enabling that in them and then like getting them to think deeper about each thing they're putting on the character and not just like arbitrarily throwing like a sticker on there and not knowing why. And so that's, yeah. that's a big part of it. And, and not everybody really gets that off the bat, but like over time, again, because we emphasize so much within our teams, like they all start spreading it out to the other people. So it's, it's really cool to see. Um, I believe you're asking like, you know, what are we looking for too? Uh, I, I think you may mean roles, like definitely a lot of concept artists, a lot of across the board, environment, character, vehicles, like graphic design. Uh, 3D. Yeah. I mean, a lot of 3D. outside of just 3D too, we're also doing our own initiatives for cinematics mm -hmm. right now. So we're looking for VFX. We're looking for yeah. 
um, texture uh, dynamics, uh, all sorts of things like across the board to mm -hmm. just experiment and play with and try. Yeah. Oh, that's 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 quite something I have to say. I had no idea. I, I actually thought you guys were just purely doing concept art, but it's it's gone way beyond that. Yeah, I mean, um, full production. A lot of it's just stuff we can't show yet. So yeah, of course, of course, of course, you know. Yeah. We can, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, one one thing I'm actually very curious about, and and I guess that it is also something that maybe will change as more people get to know you as the studio who does mm. Kydro or whatever. I mean, I mean, I, I can see that in the future, like Kydro is going to be the thing for the studio or nothing else. Right. Um, but I mean, do you feel like you're personally like ever in conflict with, let's say, because I mean, when, when a client comes and they want to get you onto the project, they tell you like, oh my gosh, we're doing the greatest thing the world has ever seen. You know, like, it's like, like you never guess it. It's like robots that come from space and transform into cars. Like, it's amazing. And you're like, you're just sitting there like, eh, okay, fine. Um, no, but no, just uh, uh, all jokes aside. But I mean, do you feel ever in conflict with, with your own storytelling ambitions? And then like the client tells you something and you, you know right off the bat it's like oh my goodness this is garbage um does the <laughs> does the company ever get you on to say like to have a say in 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 story are they looking particularly for you to add anything to that or do you feel personally sometimes in in conflict with there's what the client wants and what you think is the better way to do things there's definitely been films that i worked on that i don't agree with where the story is headed um it's not necessarily a place where I can say something usually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's like the, the view is always to give them like to, to the, the way we see it is that, you know, for us as a, if they're hiring us on, we're there to support them. So that's like the biggest part. It's like, we know end of the day, we create the art, at least for that sector of it. And it's, they have to pitch it too. Right. So it's yeah. like to us, it's like story wise, we know like it depends actually like, uh, we do pitch stuff back with ideas with like out like for example like character designs or like certain things it's actually a lot more room than you think right because sometimes they give you something that's pretty like they didn't flush it out entirely themselves either mm. and so it's like we understand that part of our job is to help like push that narrative like we know what their world is and we're like okay so how do we add how do how can we like take their world and keep adding more onto it because obviously it's like all these people that are in charge of these things, they're also really busy themselves and they're mm. handing out different yeah. like assignments. And so we're like, okay, we can, you know, again, like storytelling is such a big part of our company that we're like, how do we I help think uplift that? With certain, it, it depends on your client. Mm -hmm. There's certain clients we have yeah. that we work in the storytelling through the concept that we're doing mm -hmm. and to our best ability. Like you, you try to gauge what they're looking for, plus you add a little bit to it and mm -hmm. change things up that way. There is one client in particular that we get to do a lot more with mm -hmm. and it's they're just interesting like they're 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 more interested in creating the best product they absolutely can and so mm -hmm. they're willing to take in uh criticism thought processes things like that um and it's i, I think working with them has been one of the the most amazing times of both of our lives mm -hmm. at least from a, a designer point of view because yeah. We, we actually finally do get to be more of these creators that we've always been, mm -hmm. and we get to inject it into their world. Um, and we get to offer ideas and things that maybe they weren't even thinking about. But yeah. it's it's really just client to client, and we have to kind of, Peggy and I always do this assessment mm -hmm. every time we work with a client, and some clients are really confusing. But <laughs> a lot of clients, though, we, we sit with them, we talk with them, and afterwards, Peggy and I will talk with each other, and we're like, okay, I think based off of our past experiences, they're going to be like this the next six months while we work with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do our best breakdown that we can between each other. And we're pretty, we're pretty dead on mm -hmm. most of the time it's because we, we had a client that we had a feeling that they were going to boot us and that did happen. Mm -hmm. um, and that was out of the get go of talking with them, but we just did the paces though. We did the project. We did it to the best of our ability. We talked to them. We tried to figure things out, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's like, we felt like that connection wasn't there. Mm -hmm. um, from the get-go of talking to them. And that's that's caused us to change a lot, mm -hmm. like how we do business now, because the studio is bigger. We're actually very careful as to who we take on as clients because mm -hmm. it can wreck not just us, but our employees, our mm -hmm. contractors, mm -hmm. emotionally and physically. Yeah. Um, if you get a bad client that just doesn't respect anybody, like mm -hmm. they're just in it for themselves yeah. at the end of the day, which most clients are regardless, but we're very careful about who we work with now and, and 
because to us it's that relationship that matters over mm -hmm. time like what else can we do like what else can we do to support them and help them uh if they're interested in that and we're not looking to just be tossed under the bus which has happened so many times yeah it happens i mean i i think that uh the part robert brought up about like the, the employees and how they feel it, it is a huge part you know like for us it's like we all know what it's like to be an artist, but also you know what it's like to get a lot of notes. But at a certain point, like, you get, like, dejected, right? You get, like, how can you recreate this one thing already? You designed it, like, eight times. And they're like, we need to see another version, like, a whole, like, fleshed out version. You know, like, the team can get kind of, like, burned out on that, too. And that's true of all of us. We can get burned out. And so that's why we're very careful with who we bring on because, and what I mean is, like, the client, because um, if they get to that point, but it's, like, every time it's like that, it burns out our team. And it's, mm -hmm. like, uh, uh, you know, you're, like, it's almost, like, yeah. It's like um, you, you're you're almost like losing in a way, right? By taking on their project, which sounds really weird, but it's like definitely a real thing because it takes a while for any to, of us to, to recover. Us, our, our team matters a lot because yeah. they, they get us through everything. Mm -hmm. Like they, they, I mean, without them, there would be no gadget bot at the yeah. end of the day. Um, like Peggy and I are obviously artists, but mm -hmm. work is so much now we can't we can't do this stuff on our own. Mm -hmm. And we're not necessarily in the best place to do the work on our own mm -hmm. because there's so much that we're overseeing and looking at all the time. So it's, mm -hmm. we're always looking at like client balance and team balance because I, I never want my team to become what I was. Like there was a time period where I burnt out so hard. I didn't want anything to do with concept art. I yeah. was like, I was almost considering to do something else entirely mm -hmm. job related. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, we're very mentally aware of that for our team. Like yeah, they, they have a good experience, the best of our ability. Yeah, I think that um, we do focus on protecting our team, which is a weird idea. Like, I don't know how people talk about this, but protection of our own team, right? Because as leaders, you can, if somebody tells you, hey, we need all these things by this time, you can say, okay, I'll get it done, right? Which we do as, as much as possible. But sometimes it's just, we bring it up with our team and we're like, oof, this time frame is kind of unrealistic. Then if it is then we talk to the client again we're like hey you know like this time frame we can do but we might have to cut down this much or we need an extension so we give options um but it's also a big part of it's being careful about our team again like you know things clients can be really demanding and so it's like it is part of our job to protect our team as well and we don't necessarily always get that control but yeah. we have a pretty high percentage though that we uh, and, and that's why we're careful of the clients we work with is, yeah we want to make sure that they're receptive to us and we're receptive to them. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of them will listen to what the concerns are of like burnout of people because these clients need our artists to also go on for months, yeah. if not years on projects. And so if they're constantly just being like, this thing is due tomorrow, yeah. like what am I supposed to do with that? Like I want to burn out. My team's going to burn out with that, that type of uh, responsibility. And mm -hmm. so for us, it's like just trying to find a medium that works well for everybody, but keeps our team strong. Yeah, at the end of the day. I think that's true of all of us, right? As artists, it's like over time, like early on, you'll like do anything. You'll do like mm. any crazy time, whatever to get it done. But now we've gone to this point where we're like, oof, this is a marathon, you know, and it's a lot mm. of people running together. It's not just like yeah. me and Robert yeah. anymore. Right. So cool. be careful about that. Yeah. So I think, um, I mean, the, that's that's really great to know. Um, I as, a, as kind of like a last question. Um, mm -hmm. I think I, I want to know, like, what's what's after Kydro? Mm. <laughs> I'm sure you. Ha I'm sure you have plans. Yeah, yeah, we do. I mean, we have several other IPs that we're making. Like Kydro is one of the most like dense. heavy, dense world yeah. ones. But we actually have a bunch of others that we developed Jesus. over the years as well. But they're not as crazy. Mm, no, they're, they're, we have a few. They end up getting big, but other crazy ones. But we yeah. have. A, we also have a handful of mm -hmm. like short film ideas and projects and things like that. And mm -hmm. I think for us, we we needed to have something that we could put a stake in the ground, point mm -hmm. at and say, this is the flagship of Gadgetbot. And mm -hmm. so that's Kydro as a whole. Like we have a team of 10 people dedicated to it all the time within the company. Oh. Yeah. And they're creating not just the comic, but they're creating other forms of content and things like that, that Peggy and I are overseeing. Yeah. But the next stage, and this is the goal after the goal, this is the big thing that Peggy and I are pushing towards this year and next mm -hmm. year, is really starting to flush out like a cinematics team within the company because we already have all the individual parts of it. Mm -hmm. We have VFX people, we have 3D people. Um, and so for us now, it's just to start doing experimentation on the yeah. inside. And it's not necessarily Kydro mm -hmm. that we're going to do mm -hmm. stuff with, which is like, obviously like the artist in us is like, I want to make Kydro right now. But you're like, no, 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 hold back. Like you're, you're already making the story and the comic, the yeah. manga, like all that stuff is living. Now try to get the pro like get the studio to thrive 
and and learn off of creating other individual little ideas. And mm -hmm. so that's what a lot of this year is going to be is starting to develop those animations and play with those things. But even beyond Kydro, you know, Kydro itself we had set for three seasons. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, we actually have an extended version of Kydro that's almost more like Star Trek. That gets more serial, it can go on forever and yeah. doesn't follow the main characters. And so we have a lot of different ideas in different areas that extend off of that IP that come yeah. out in other little IPs. Um, yeah, I mean, like Robert's saying, it's like, you know, regardless, Kydro's going to keep going. And so in that, they always, there's always other projects, again, to kind of spread out your portfolio, right? So it's like, instead of like one portfolio piece, there's multiple pieces now into different like genres and different areas, like it's animation or live action, whatever it is. So it's, we don't have them all exactly like fleshed out, but we are thinking about ways of how we can flesh it out again, yeah. like what Robert's saying, like kind of cinematic kind of way so we can push it out um, for, for Gadgetbot. So it's like what we love to do, IP development. The next right. thing you can expect from us is our VR game with, yeah. the, with <laughs> the comic. That's the next big wow, thing we're working crazy. on. We're trying to get that to come out with Comic 2 once Comic 2 is done and we bring it to Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. So that we're in the process of scheduling and aligning all that stuff to fit with each other. Yeah. That's it's crazy. definitely a lot. <laughs> so oh my! I don't. I don't even know where to start. You. I think you guys are still so young, and you have done more than most people will do in their entire lifetime. I think. <laughs> Emmanuel, do you have any <laughs> any last so questions? Yeah. It, so. <laughs> no, I'm good. I mean, yeah. That's, it's crazy. Do you guys really have anything? Yeah. Any last thing you wanna you wanna mention? Um. Mm. We touched well, on a lot of things. Yeah. We pitched a lot throughout this entire yeah, thing. Yeah, I guess. But... By the time I think we talked about, it, by the time this. Uh, episode comes out our episode two of the manga of uh, Kaido will be out on webtoons yeah. so oh, awesome. there is a kickstarter going right now yeah. but it's going to be done by the <laughs> time this video comes out but the kickstarter is already successful mm -hmm. and it's pretty much done at this mm -hmm. point nice. we're just waiting for it to wrap up in the next five days yeah but uh you will be able to buy an actual manga version of Kaido after the kickstarter yeah, the as well paperback paperback yeah. uh, oh wow those, cool you know, so, mm -hmm. um, of course, we'll put all the links and anything where people can reach you, where can people apply to work at Gadget, yeah. where can people yes. uh, watch Kite. We're, we're going to all put it in the description. Um, and uh, we wish you the best of luck with, of course, all, all your all your endeavors and all the projects. And I'm going to I'm going to go watch, uh, going to have a look at Kaido right now, I think. Okay. Um, <laughs> so um, best of luck and, and thanks so much for, for coming on and sharing all this, all this great thing. I think a lot of people will get hopefully um, a better idea of what to do with all their crazy IP ideas in their heads. Right. So um, yeah. thanks Just again for coming stop. on. That's the biggest thing. <laughs> yeah. Do don't stop. stop. Don't stop. Just you you got to. Keep developing it no matter yeah. what, and just you'll you'll figure out something with it at the end of the awesome. day. Awesome! I think that if if your story uh, has taught us anything, it's it's perseverance pays pays off, right? So, yeah. um, to our audience, uh, thank you so much for tuning in. If you like this episode, please like, comment, and subscribe, and we see you guys next week. Bye. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you.